looking at Yankee Stadium, where the Yankees and the Twins have been postponed by rain, so one of our scheduled games has been lost to the weatherman. Thus, you'll be looking in at Comiskey Park in Chicago, where the White Sox host the American champion Oakland A's, the start of a double-headed day of baseball here on NBC with our late game featuring either the Mets and Cardinals from St. Louis or the Astros and the Dodgers in Los Angeles. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marv Albert, and we welcome you to our pregame show, the start of our baseball day here on NBC. And later on, I'll be talking to the Yankees' outspoken manager, Dallas Green, and also a chat with the assistant coach of the touring Soviet Union baseball team. Obviously, a learning experience for the Soviets because they have been losing by scores of 21 to 1, 20 to 1, and 11 to 1 to various American college baseball teams. First, though, a check of what took place around the majors last night and yesterday. The Cubs made it six straight wins. First place record of seven and two. Mitch Williams with his fifth save and five save opportunities. Cubs over the field, six to four. The struggling Mets broke out with a seven-run fifth inning. Greg Jeffries had the key hit, a three-run double. The Mets with a revamped lineup knocked off the Cardinals, 9-4. Kevin Mitchell has been on fire for the Giants in San Francisco last night. He hit his fourth home run, knocked in three more runs for a major league leading 14 RBIs. Giants seven, Braves five. American League Western leading Texas made it six straight wins off this two-run pitch single by Rick Leach in the eighth. Rangers now eight and one. They beat Detroit four to two. The best pitch game yesterday. Jimmy Key of Toronto had a no-hitter into the seventh. Finished with a two-hitter. Blue Jays blanked the Royals three nothing. And last night it was another rough outing for Frank Viola. And here's the most intriguing call of the night by Yankee announcer Phil Rizzuto. Holy cow! Yes, Steve Balboni turning the jeers to cheers as he came up with uh, the big hit as the Yankees knocked off the Twins up at the stadium by the score of 8-5. to five. And one-time Yankee Goose Gossage, released by the Cubs last month, has signed on with the Giants. The 37-year-old Goose had control problems during the spring. When we come back, a talk with Yankee manager Dallas Green feeling a little bit better about things with two straight wins after seven straight losses. The Yankees' worst start since 1975. NBC Sports presents Major League Baseball, an inside look. Brought to you by MasterCard. You can count on MasterCard to help you master the moment. And by Midas. Nobody beats Midas. Nobody. This have not gone well over the first ten games. They have won three. They've lost seven, although they have won their last two. And Dallas is back in baseball after sitting out a year. He was manager of the 1980 World Championship Phillies. He spent six years as general manager of the Chicago Cubs, and his Cubs won the Eastern Division in 1984. And Dallas Green has joined us from Yankee Stadium. But Dallas, the way things have gone for the Yankees over the first two weeks, have you ever said to yourself, now why did I take this job? <laughs> Marv, you're right there. It, it was very frustrating for us, uh, the first uh, seven, eight ball games here. We just, uh, we just aren't a team yet. We've, uh, uh, we've got a melting pot uh, group here. Twelve guys have never played on the Yankees before, and only four guys on our team really have played more than four years together. So we're still learning about each other. Well, you have been refreshingly candid about your ball club. Last week, you were widely quoted as saying, we stink. <laughs> Have you ever said that about any of your teams in the past? Oh, I, I think I think you know, the guys that have played with me and the people that have covered uh, the clubs that I've managed uh, know that I'm open and honest about things. You can't hide that, uh, Marv. We were bad. We played bad baseball. We just we just did things that uh, little leaguers had had uh, a better chance of surviving than we did. Uh, we did some some terrible things on the field, and and uh, a lot of people were watching us. Uh, uh, play the game so you can't lie about that and I don't lie about the way the players play and I don't lie the way about the uh, about how I manage uh, that's just the way I am then I know you were annoyed with uh, some of the Yankee players who went off to hide in the trainers room after a couple of losses to avoid talking to the media you were quoted as saying the egos are such that they can accept the accolades but they beat you over the head for writing what they did wrong and all you're looking at is 
is facts. Are the players back to talking? Well, you've won a couple, so I think they're talking a bit now. Well, that 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 uh, just comes from learning each other as well, Marv. You know, I, uh, I, I'm an open guy. At the same time, I expect my baseball players to be professionals, and that's all I ask them to do. Part of the professional act should be the, the handling of the press and the media, particularly when in the rough times. You know, all of us like to, to be batted on the back, and all of us like to to accept the wins and the accolades that come with winning, but we, we have a heck of a time dealing with the losses, and a lot, of, a lot of players do run and hide, and I don't like that because when I have to answer all the questions all the time, I don't think that's fair for the manager to have to do that all the time. Now, earlier in the week, you received kind of a vote of confidence from George Steinbrenner, <laughs> the dreaded vote of confidence, Dallas. Is there a fear of your being fired? Can you handle that at this point? Oh, Marv, I... I've never been afraid of, of getting fired in my life. I'm not afraid of, of uh, George Steinbrenner or the, or the New York scene at all. Uh, I know, I knew in my heart when I took this job, it, it had a chance to be volatile. But at the same time, I respect George for the one thing that he really wants to do for New York and the New York fans, and that's win. That's what I'm all about, and I understand that if you don't win, the consequences are pretty tough. Dallas, in a moment, we'll be talking with the assistant coach of the touring Soviet baseball team that has been pounded by college teams over the first week or so. Any advice for the Soviets? I hope Gorbachev can pitch. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you, the game is still difficult for them. The other day, they had a coach screaming instructions when a ball was hit to the outfield. They wanted the ball to go to second base, and they're yelling, second base, second base. That's the bag in the middle of the field. Uh-oh. Uh, have you had that type of confusion with fundamental baseball at all? Well, we have not played fundamentally sound baseball here in New York, so uh, we, we, don't have, we, don't have, we can't give the, the Soviets much help. But uh, uh, it will take time. Uh, any new, new, new game, particularly the, the, with all the nuances that can go on in baseball, uh, it's going to take the Soviets some time. All right, Dallas, thank you very much. Good, Mark. Good, Good to be with you. you. All right, Dallas Green, manager of the New York Yankees, coming up a look back at the week in review. And the Soviets have made their way to the U.S. to learn about baseball, and it has been a rough go. You know, I think for me, one of the, the fondest memories I have of Major League Baseball was my, my one and only visit to a uh, an all-star game and it was the time that the game was being played in uh, san diego and i was doing a local television show there that was being produced by a lovely young woman and i asked her uh, can you get tickets for me to go to the contest tonight and she said well i'll see what i can do and it just so happened that uh, on the show that day jim rice uh, had been a guest who uh, outfielder for the boston red sox powerful power hitting outfielder and uh, she got friendly with jim and i think kind of led jim to believe that if he came through with some tickets well, I'll leave the rest to your imagination. And so she got the tickets from him, <laughs> and I got to use them. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <laughs> yes, Dave, weaving a knee slapper. Well, the International Olympic Committee has granted the sport of baseball medal status for the Barcelona Summer Games in 1992. So the Soviet Union, which has not to this point claimed to have invented the sport of baseball, started a national baseball program last year, and the Soviets are in the midst of a three-week, 12-game United States tour, which has not gone well, including a 21-1 loss to the Naval Academy, eight errors committed by the Soviets. Yes, they've had some jittery moments, but remember, they did not start playing hockey until the mid-40s, but the Soviets won the Olympic gold in 1956. They now dominate that sport worldwide, and look how far they have come in basketball. We are joined by Soviet baseball assistant coach Gela Chikradza from our NBC affiliate in Portsmouth, Virginia. Tonight, the Soviets will face the AA uh, Peninsula Pilots. Uh, first of all, Gala, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. What are your goals? What are you looking to accomplish on this tour of the United States? We are uh, come uh, in the United States um, for le learning. We, uh, we, uh, we need um, very much information about uh, this uh, nice game. Before uh, it's a very difficult game. I uh, I bel believe that we uh, must ha we will have uh, more experience in this country. What do you and some of the players find most difficult about the game of baseball? Uh, uh, for our players, uh, it's uh, most difficult uh, just 
teaching. It's a very unusual um, motion for, of, of our um, players. It's very, very difficult. Uh, we, we have some uh, s uh, strong boys, but uh, it's uh, very difficult for them to um, have, have a control and to uh, know some uh, difficult pitches like uh, cool ball or slider or knuckleball and the other. Uh, they have no so, so well control. Who are some of the American players that you and the Soviet players admire? Oh, we know some baseball players. I, my favorite team is uh, Los Angeles Dodgers, and I uh, met them in um, Florida last year when I was there. And uh, in, in, uh, last year, uh, for five days, I met the, here there uh, Mike Sosha, uh, Kirk Gibson, and uh, Hershelson and other uh, players. It's great. Gallo, what is the strangest thing that you've seen during the course of your days here in the United States? Well, I know that uh, American cigarettes are, are very best, are, are best, but uh, American don't smoke. It's very interesting. Why? Can hurt throwing the curveball. You realize if you smoke. <laughs> G Gala, thank you for coming on with us. And tonight the uh, Soviets will be going up against a professional team, the Peninsula Pilots, a Double A team uh, in Portsmouth, Virginia, hoping to at least keep the score down. This past week in the major leagues, some of the top pitchers kept the hits down. Three one hitters were thrown with the standout performance turned in by 42-year-old Nolan Ryan of the Texas Rangers. Ryan struck out a Texas team record 15 batters and had a perfect game going against Milwaukee for six and two thirds. Then leading off in the eighth inning, Terry Francona spoiled the no-hit bid with this base hit. Ryan seeking a sixth no-hitter finished up with a one-hitter over eight. First triple play of the season pulled off by San Diego, Luis Salazar, to Roberto Alamado, Jack Clark, and on to the plate, and they get three. A triple play. Best catches of the week. Andy Van Slyke of the Pirates pulling off thievery to rob Gary Carter of the Mets. And Fred Lynn of Detroit with this spectacular play, taking away extra bases from Tim Loudner of the Twins. Fred O.K. just resting up. The most explosive hitting the past week, Corey Snyder of Cleveland, slamming two two-run home runs. He knocked in six. Indians beat the Red Sox 10 to six. And the best snowfall of the season last Saturday in Chicago prior to a Cub Pirate game, leading to this fine medley of the Pittsburgh dugout. Weather outside is frightful, and I am so delightful. I don't want to play. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. <laughs> Not quite snow, but uh, weather conditions here in New York have already cost us the Yankee twin game that was scheduled for the second of a three-game setup at Yankee Stadium. So coming up, it will be the Oakland A's and the Chicago White Sox, first part of our a doubleheader followed by either the Mets and the Cardinals or the Astros and the Dodgers. And we'd like to extend our uh, best wishes and good luck to Charlie Slows, the radio voice of the Washington Bullets and the one-time voice of uh, the Tidewater Tides as uh, Charlie will be making his network debut with uh, Larry Durka, the one-time Astro pitcher. They'll be working the Astros and the Dodgers. Charlie coming out of the bullpen with our expanded schedule. That about wraps it for the pregame. I'm Marv Albert. Thanks for tuning in. Baseball after this from NBC News. The National Broadcasting Company, now in its seventh decade of bringing you baseball's memories. Baseball's milestone. Baseball's magical moment. And baseball's miracle. NBC Sports proudly presents the Major League Baseball Game of the Week.
weather in Chicago a welcome sight. Bright sunshine, a cloudless blue sky, and there will be baseball at Comiskey Park as the Oakland A's meet the Chicago White Sox. Hi, everyone. I'm Ted Robinson along with Bobby Mercer. Two teams in the early season here that have been devastated by injury. Bobby, Oakland seems to be a club well-suited to handle it, though. Well, they got Mark McGuire, Conseco out. Those are two big guns out of a ball club like the Oakland A's. But they should be able to weather this storm because they've got great pitching. They've got a good bullpen. They've got a lot of depth. Tony Phillips, Stan Javier that can take over. So I don't think that they will be uh, that bad off with the uh, McGuire and Conseco injuries. On the other hand, the Chicago White Sox, they got Pasqua, they got Fisk, they got Walker. They've got guys that they cannot replace. They're a young ball club, but they don't have that kind of depth that the Oakland A's has. Bob Welch pitches today against Jerry Royce. Tony LaRusso puts a lot of faith in that starting pitching, and he spoke about his team start earlier with Bobby. Talking with Tony LaRusso, the uh, skipper of the Oakland A's, also the American League Manager of the Year in 1988. And Tony, you probably know it, of the past 10 World Series losers, the team has never come back to win the division championship in the following year. What are you going to do to not be one of those victims? Well, uh, we're going to just try and take care of our business, Bob. Uh, you know, we can't control what's happening in the division. There's a lot of good teams there this year. I think the league's going to be very tough, but what we're going to do is we're not going to take anything for granted. We're not going to look at last year's success and expect that it's going to help us this year. We're, people say we're the hunter, not the hunter. We're hunting. You know, we're hunting that championship again this year. Uh, I like our ball club a lot. Mostly, we have guys that like to compete. So the competition's on again this year, and we're going to take our shot. All right, the big story of Conseco and McGuire. Can you give us an update on those two? Well, I think Mark will be back sooner than Jose. Uh, I, in fact, I got the feeling, based on conversations this morning, that Mark will be back about the time his disabled period is over, so another, you know, 10 days or so. In Jose's case, uh, it may be a month, because we're going to be so sure before he ever plays a game that that thing is healed that you may still see him out for a while. The Game of the Week is brought to you by the Heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. By AC Delco, automotive parts that don't just fit, they match. By Turtle Wax, for that eye-catching, head-turning, double-taking, no-mistaking Turtle Wax shine. And by John Deere and your local John Deere dealer. This is the lineup Oakland will send out against Jerry Royce today, missing some familiar names in the middle. It will have Tony Phillips at second base leading off. Stan Javier will be in left field batting second. Dave Henderson, the center fielder, bats third. At first base, Terry Steinbach batting cleanup. Third baseman, Carney Lansford, fifth. Dave Parker, the DH, batting sixth. Billy Bean, just recalled from the minor leagues two days ago, is the right fielder batting seventh. Mike Gallego at shortstop bats eighth. And Rod Hesse will catch and bat ninth as Canseco, McGuire, Walt Weiss, and Glenn Hubbard all missing today due to injury. Well, Jerry Royce is 39 years old. He's an 18 major leagues player. He's 1-1, one 3.46 one, earn run average this year. Look for Royce to have good control this afternoon. He will have to. That is his trademark. He also has a good fastball, but he cuts that fastball in on the hands of the right-handed hitters in this open day lineup. He also has a good curveball and a change. And the defense behind Royce, and this may be the key to the White Sox season, the worst defensive team in baseball last year. This year, they're hoping Eddie Williams can solidify third base with Gia and their great shortstop. Lions and Robodeau, the right side of the infield. Boston Gallagher and Baines, the outfield. And rookie Matt Marullo behind the plate. He is replacing the injured Carlton Fisk. And we are set to go as Tony Phillips stands in for Oakland. And we are just glad we can bring you a baseball game here on NBC that the gods of the weather world have finally cooperated somewhere and we have a beautifully sunny and clear if not crisp and cool Saturday afternoon. One thing about this Oakland A's ball club that they come to the plate swinging. They will not wait for that pitch. They just like to jump right on top of it if they can. And Phillips quickly in a two strike hole. His 30th birthday today his value to Oakland really shines in periods like this, Bobby, when they're hit by injury. He can play about six different positions for them. One of the guys that we were talking about earlier with the depth on this Oakland A's ball club is Tony Phillips. He can play all the outfield positions. He can also play all the infield positions. A ball and two strikes from Jerry Royce, who will be 40 years of age in June.
13 game winner for the White Sox last year after starting the year in the bullpen. No swing, says Larry Barnett, the home plate umpire. And the count is two and two. That's that cut fastball that he likes to run in on the hands of these right-handed batters. He will try to keep these first two guys off the bases if, if he can, because they're going to take they're going to take a look at uh, Matt Marullo's arm, the youngster behind the plate. Foul right back, just to our right and out of play. Hope you still have those quick reflexes with you, Bobby. We may need them today. Never had them. <laughs> I could tell you right now, I don't have them either. <laughs> Along with Bobby Mercer, Ted Robinson, and Comiskey Park. If you were tuning in expecting to see the Twins and the Yankees, that game has been rained out in New York today. But no weather problems here in Chicago. In the first game of your Game of the Week doubleheader. And the count now runs full at 3-2 and two to Phillips. Glenn Hubbard, the regular Oakland second baseman, or as regular as any second baseman on their club is, a slight hamstring pull. And he is going to be out for several days. He did that yesterday on the uh, soft turf just outside of second base towards the right field uh, area. And Royce loses the leadoff man after getting ahead 0-2. That's one of the things that Jerry Royce does not want to do with these Oakland batters is put them on, and he is, relies a lot on his control. He doesn't want to fall behind these hitters 2-0, and 3-1 oh, and one every time because that means that he has to come in with that fastball, and he relies so much on his control. Now he's got problems with speed on the bases. And the switch hitting Stan Javier, the batter. Javier off to a good start at 318. Thus far hitting much better left-handed. Another butt attempt, and Marullo will not be able to catch up to it. Matt Marullo just up from the minor leagues this week to replace Carlton Fisk. He hit his first major league home run here yesterday in the ninth inning. The fireworks display that normally accompanies home runs here didn't happen yesterday because the power had gone out in the eighth inning. And so as the White Sox took the field to start the game, that scoreboard went off to give Marullo his day late salute. He said all the fireworks went off in his head, so he really didn't need the fireworks here at Comiskey. Phillips getting a decent lead at first. Hit on the ground to Guillen. They get one, and Lyons throw pulls Robodeau off the bag at first, but Javier, who runs exceptionally well, Look to have beaten the throw anyway. The speed of Tony Phillips is what causes the Chicago White Sox not to complete this double play. You can see he's off with the ground ball again. A good throw to Lyons at second base, but Lyons held onto the ball just a little bit too long, and that allowed Phillips to get on top of him and knock him off balance, and the throw was wide. That's, that's a good aggressive uh, start for the Oakland A's. They know that they have to do that in order to win with those big guys out of the lineup. Now here is one big guy who has continued to swing a hot bat even in the absence of Canseco and McGuire. Dave Henderson who had what could be termed a career year last year. Tony La Russa says though this guy is legit. And I agree with him. He has come full circle. Henderson has and he really solidified as you said the outfield. He's the big guy right now in this lineup, and he's the guy that they look to to provide the long ball and the leadership. Jerry Royce with an 0-1 career mark against Oakland. Pitched a couple of times against the A's in relief last year. Javier had a string of stolen bases before Marullo threw him out at second base yesterday. It's up to Royce to keep that runner close at first. Henderson taking, and it's ball two. Two and one now to Dave Henderson as we're just underway. First inning and no score. A little bit easier 
for the left-handed pitcher to hold that runner at first base. So that'll help Marulo out behind the plate. Yesterday, Javier was getting big jumps off of uh, Perez, who is a right-hander with a big league kick. Two and two the count now. 1987, Jerry Royce was released by three clubs. The Dodgers, the Reds, and then at year's end by the Angels. He has truly been a baseball Lazarus. It had an elbow operation, and a lot of people just gave up on it. That happens a lot when you've had that operation. No swing on the appeal to first. Dale Ford, the umpire at first base today. Greg Cox gets second. There's Mr. Ford. And John Hirschbeck at third, rounding out Larry Barnett's crew. Tony LaRusso, who in the other dugout at Comiskey Park, won a division in 1983 and learned some very valuable lessons about trying to repeat the following year. Javier running on a foul back. I don't think you find a manager, Bobby, anywhere in baseball who comes to the park better prepared, not just for what happens on the field, but for what happens in the minds of players and in the clubhouse than Tony Lewis. And that is so important because and until you can recognize the 24 personalities on your ball club, I don't think you can get the best out of them anyway. You have to recognize those personalities and treat them as such. That's probably, Ted, the biggest job a manager has to do. Once a, once a guy reaches the major league level, I mean, he's got the tools and he's going to play. But in order to get that guy to play 100% for you in 162 ball games, that's the, that's the hard part. Runner goes again, another foul back. Meanwhile, in the other dugout, the White Sox being led by first-year manager Jeff Torborg, who has only managed one full season previously in the major leagues when he was in Cleveland. That is White Sox base coach Ron Clark. Torborg is keeping warm right now. He's back in hiding somewhere. There's Jeff. One thing about Jeff, this is his second term as a manager in the big leagues, and he says it's a different story this time because he's more mature. He knows exactly what he wants to do first time around. Javier running again, and there's a towering fly ball to left field. Darrell Boston, though, fighting the swirling wind to haul it in. And Javier returns to first. So a good battle between Royce and Henderson. Several 3-2 pitches fouled off. And Finally, Henderson skies one to left. Well, Henderson just misses this ball. He gets out of front just a bit, just a hair. That allows him to uppercut the ball. If he gets on top of that, it's two to nothing, Oakland. But that's the one thing that Royce wants to stay away from is that three and two pitch all the time to these uh, big sluggers from the right side. It's going to be a tough day for the outfielders if you look out at the flags trying to judge this wind. It is literally swirling. Runner goes on the first pitch, which is a strike, and he is in. The throw hitting Javier, who steals the base, his third of the year. Got a huge jump off of Jerry Royce. Stan Javier, who can do so much for this Oakland A ball club. And you can see it right here. Marulo really didn't have a chance of throwing him out. He had such a big lead and a big jump off the pitcher with no chance for the catcher. No chance for Steinbach to knock a run home here with two down. And a one strike count. And now 0-2. Oh Good look at the Stan Javier's big jump. One thing about a runner when he gets on first base, especially when you have the speed of a Javier, is that you study that movement by that pitcher. So many guys now use that head first slide into second and a third. The real good base stealers love that, don't they? For instance, the Yankees have tried to get Ricky Anderson to stop that several times without success. Foul back. But you can steal bases like Ricky Anderson. You, <laughs> you say, okay, Ricky, dive head first, go any way you want to go. A lot of them feel like that they can get to the base a lot quicker. But 
but you run the risk of jamming a lot of fingers. You can jam your shoulder, sprain your wrist. That's the one thing that they worry about when a, when a base shooter uh, slides in head first at these bases. Now Royce trying to finish off Steinbach here, ahead 0-2. Blocked by Marullo. Talked a lot about this youngster. He was called up, of course, when Carlton Fisk was put on the disabled list with the broken hand. He had started the uh, season in the minor leagues, but he's getting valuable playing time now. He will be learning a, a lot from a guy like Jerry Royce, who has been around 18 years, and also Jeff Torborg, an ex-catcher. Hard hit ball, but right to Guillen at shortstop. And the inning is over. So Royce survives the leadoff walk, and Oakland goes out without scoring in their half of the first. Guillen leading off at shortstop, followed by center fielder Dave Gallagher, right fielder Harold Baines. Yvonne Calderon, the DH, bats cleanup, and it's catcher Matt Marullo, first baseman Billy Joe Robodeau, left fielder Darrell Boston, second baseman Steve Lyons, and third baseman Eddie Williams. And the right-handed pitcher Bob Welch is 32 years old. He is off to a fast start. He's 2-0 with an 0-5-6 earn run average. Won a career-high 17 games last year. He also has his personal catcher in the lineup this afternoon in Ron Hassey. Hassey and Bob Welch last year teamed up to combine uh, on a 14-3 record. So there's Hassey. Hassey normally wouldn't be playing today because the left-handed pitcher Jerry Royce, but because uh, Welch is out on the mound, Hassey's in there. And Ozzie Guillen to start things off for the White Sox. The first major change Jeff Torborg made as White Sox manager in his search for a leadoff hitter was to put the free swinging and uh, normally undisciplined Ozzie Guillen in the leadoff spot. One and one the count. Well, Ozzie's the kind of guy that he, <laughs> he's not looking for the walk. He's up there, as you say, Ted. He's a free swinger, but Walt Reniak, the new hitting instructor now for the Chicago White Sox, he has said that uh, I asked him about Guillen, and he said, well, all I'm trying to do is just to get Ozzie to swing it a few less bad balls that come up there. He knows that Ozzie's going to be swinging. He's not looking for that walk, but if you can just make a more of a compact swing and get a better pitch to swing at, he'll be happy with that. Of course, Guillen's strength is marvelous play in the field. And his White Sox career has been marked with some inconsistent time at the plate and a very low on base percentage. And that's what the White Sox would like to see him cure here in this leadoff spot. Welch working quickly. Tap back up the middle. Gallego. But he can't get Guillen, who beats it out for an infield hit. Nice range up the middle by Gallego, but unable to make the play as we look at the athletics defensively. And the changes at Steinbach at first, Gallego and Phillips playing at short and second, and Billy Bean playing in right field today. Athletics, very good defensive club last year. Major strides in improving in that area. Now Dave Gallagher, he is hitting eight straight off to a good start at 317. Guillen getting a very big lead as Welch steps off. Hassey doesn't have that strong arm behind the plate, so it'll be up to Bob Welch, like Jerry Royce, to hold that runner on at first, and Guillen is certainly a threat to uh, steal second base. That also helps out that second-place hitter. The more times that Guillen can get on that second-place hitter, he's going to end up with more fastballs to swing at. So that'll help Gallagher or whoever else bats in that second spot for the White Sox. He had stolen base numbers this year. The White Sox have to be thinking without Carlton Fisk, without Greg Walker, without Dan Pasqua, they have to be thinking, scrapping and trying to get a run any chance they can. Yes. They don't have the big guns in there. And the one swing of the bat from either one of those three guys. And off on the pitch. Is in. Pitch 
was a strike to Gallagher. And the stolen base by Guillen, his fourth. That's one of the reasons the White Sox want Guillen to lead off because if he can cut down on uh, swinging at some bad balls, he's going to be on the bases a lot. And he's going to put havoc in the eyes of those catchers because he is an igniter. It'll be up to Gallagher now to move him over to third. Inside, and it's one and one. One of the things that uh, Jeff Torborg stresses on this ball club, that this, especially since it's a young ball club, is fundamental. to hit the ball to right field. Move the runner, fouling it. There's no question, Bobby, that's what the White Sox hired Torborg to do. Last year, they were not a very good fundamental ball club. No, in fact, they led the major leagues in errors, mistakes. They just don't have the kind of ball club that can make the mistakes that they made last year and give the opposing ball club four and five outs in one inning. short right. Bean, though, will have time as the ball hangs. And that is the first out of the inning. With Guillen holding at second. I call that a fundamental error. Yes, he did try to go to right field, but if he didn't feel comfortable with the power pitcher, Bob Welch out on the mound, Gallagher being a right-handed batter, he should have tied the bunt at least two times to get Guillen over to third base. And as you were talking, uh, with the guys like Pasqua and Fisk and Walker out of this lineup, they need to scratch for every run. Now we have Harold Baines, who is probably the best hitter in, in their lineup today. What will they do with Baines? They may pitch around Harold Baines now. That's exactly what Harold Baines saw quite a bit of last year. See, this year he's off to a terrific start. Led all American League DHs last year in runs batted in with 78. And this year, he has returned to the outfield for the first time in two years. To play in the outfield on all grass surfaces. And Bob Welch, he will pitch very careful to Baines. As you saw, he painted the outside corner for the first strike. He'll also uh, try to backdoor these left-handers with a curveball. The ball and a strike now to Baines with Calderon next. Welch had some trouble, and here you see the designated hitter for the White Sox, called a row. Haynes lops it into shallow left center. Javier has it for out number two. The two fly ball outs after the steal of second by Guillen. And now it will be up to Calderon. DHing for just the second time this season. And coming off an injury plague season. Got it on both sides, Bobby. Had surgery on his left shoulder and has a chronically bad right hamstring. Foul pop near the Oakland dugout. And Hassey will run out of room. Away with the win. Uh the wind is blowing here at Comiskey Park. Both the first baseman and the catcher and the pitcher, they have to stay with that baseball as long as they can because it may blow right back onto the playing field. You watch the flags up above Comiskey here blowing. A lot of times that wind will swirl around inside the ballpark. today you would suspect somebody's going to really have to crank one to hit it out of here. That's an awful feeling too when you go to, to the plate and you know you're a power hitter. You really got to make sure that you don't miss when you make contact with a baseball. And a hard thrower like Welch is going to try to pitch inside a lot today, isn't he? Absolutely. He is a power pitcher and he, he, he's the kind of guy that will establish that inside fastball on these right-handed hitters. Sets up pitches just like that. He's got Calderon thinking about that inside fastball. The next thing you know, he slips one on the outside corner. On a chilly day, you get jammed once, and you might feel that in your hands for the next two or three at-bats. 
2-2 here. Poked out into right field, and B makes a sliding grab on a tough ball to end the first inning. White Sox leave a runner at second. No score after one. Calderon makes excellent contact on a tough pitch on the outside corner and takes the ball to right field, but Billy Bean makes an outstanding play to save the Oakland A's a run. Billy Bean, who played first base yesterday for the Oakland A's, is in right field this afternoon. Outstanding play by Billy Bean. So now we go to the second inning with no score. And Carney Lansford will lead off for Oakland. Had a four-hit day here yesterday. And this time of the year, four-hit days will get your batting average up by a pretty good chunk. Before that time, Carney had been uh, only three for 22. Breaking ball for a strike from Rice, and it's one and one. Carney's got that nervous movement in his hands before the pitcher releases the ball. There's an unusual at bat right off the bat. The Red Sox leading the Orioles after two at Fenway. And Texas leading the American League West and leading the Tigers today. There's a foul by Lansford, a notorious first ball hitter, and he's run the count out two and two. You know, I mentioned that nervous movement by Carney Lansford with his hands, but really that is his timing mechanism. A lot of guys will move their feet at home plate, sway their hips. Uh, Carney likes to move those hands, and you will notice right before the pitcher releases the ball, he'll stop. And he goes right up the middle for a leadoff hit. Carney Lansford starting the second with a single. And someone that Royce and the White Sox will have to pay attention to. He is known as a deceptive base stealer. Not terribly fast, but a good runner and has had some good stolen base years. Now Dave Parker, who gets a chance to play against lefties while the A's are hurt with some injuries. There's a big guy, Bobby, who still wants to prove to people he's not done. He had perhaps the worst, you could call it the worst year of his career last year. Injury riddled and not as productive as a Dave Parker year normally would be. Pretty much relegated to the designated hitter role. They talked maybe uh, playing Parker at first base a little bit. It's for off. It's a strike. Throw is high and a stolen base. thing that Tony La Russa will do he will test this young arm of Matt Marullo until he proves that the Oakland A's cannot run on him and you you can you can bet that Tony knows uh, that Marullo will be thinking about those runners now when they get on at first base and at second base you got to be careful with Lansford at second now yeah, Parker really turns on that hammers it foul deep down the right field line. Of course, Dave has had those bad knees and has really uh, hampered his mobility. Plays the outfield every once in a while. But he adds leadership to this ball club. He hit only 182 against left-handed pitching last year. These early games against lefties will sure be a testing point. Stuck the bat out there and pokes it to the short right center where Lyons has it for the out. One of the factors that the Oakland A's have in their lineup today is the fact that they've got two left-handers that normally would not be in the lineup against the left-handed pitcher Jerry Royce and to take a look at Lansford down at second. And that's all because of the injuries. So that's a minus for the A's. Billy Bean an acquisition of little note during the offseason for Oakland that suddenly turns out to be important in April. He was signed as a non-roster player. Had a very good spring for the A's. Didn't make the club coming north because they took 11 pitchers north, but as soon as McGuire went down with the back injury earlier this week, Bean was brought back in. Played a couple of years for Minnesota and 
briefly last year for Detroit. No doubt that's the reason why the Oakland A's signed him. Lansford is going to third, and they have a play on him, and Guillen throws him out. Trying to advance, and a ball hit in front of him, and Lansford is nailed by Guillen. Middle, a middle error on the runner, Carney Lansford. Easy ground ball, the shortstop again. In fact, Lansford even has to back up just a bit, a little, a little bit, let the ball get by him, and he is out at third base. Not a good play by the runner, Lansford. Did you say that is the cardinal rule, Bobby? If the ball's in front of you, you don't run? Absolutely. Especially when you have to hold up just a second to let the ball go by. Good play by Guillen, though. Uh, two outs and Mike Gallego standing in with Bean the runner at first. Another pleasant surprise in the early going Gallego playing while Walt Weiss is sidelined with the flu. And he has had nine hits and 18 at bats thus far. Gallego is here could be construed as something of a medical marvel as he was stricken with testicular cancer early in his career in the Oakland organization. As part of a season recovering from that, completely beat it and made it to the major leagues. One and one the count. You often wonder, with the 39-year-old Royce out on the mound and the youngster, early 22-year-old, 23-year-old Marulo, who's calling the game. Hard to see that youngster uh, taking a look at Jeff Torborg just about every pitch over in the uh, White Sox dugout. Jeff Torborg said he doesn't want to call a game for Marulo, and he's an old catcher. He understands that. Runner goes. Short right field, a long run here for Baines. But he gets there to make the play. And the inning over, a leadoff single, but no runs for the A's in the second. Oakland has produced the last three American League rookies of the year, two of them sitting there. Jose Canseco on the left with that left wrist in a cast. Walter Weiss on the right, they're both out today. Mark McGuire, the other rookie of the year, is back at home in the Bay Area, receiving some therapy on his injured back. Ted Robinson and Bobby Mercer with you at Comiskey Park in Chicago. No score in the bottom of the second inning. It's the first game of our doubleheader today. Those of you expecting to see the Twins and the Yankees, that game has been rained out. Coming up in game two, most of you see Daryl Strawberry and the Mets take on the Cardinals. Some of you will see the Astros and Dodgers in Los Angeles. And Matt Marullo goes down watching a called strike three. Welcome to the bigs, rookie. Well, you know what? Despite the strikeout by Matt Marullo, when you mention this youngster's name, and you're talking to Jeff Torborg, boy, his eyes just light up because not only being a what Torborg thinks will be an outstanding defensive catcher, he has a good bat and a nice short, quick stroke and should benefit from Walt Reniak. Billy Joe Robodeau taking strike one. One time starter and a good prospect in the Milwaukee organization before several series of injuries. Despite what uh, Billy Joe does, he's got a great name. <laughs> like he Running back kicks for LSU. Yeah. <laughs> Welch working quickly. Two and one. And now three and one. One of the biggest assets that Bob Welch has, besides the 90-plus 
fastball is the fact that he can spot that fastball. He Look can... at the difference in catching. That's his numbers last year. The A's two catchers. This year, both of Welch's games have been with Ron Hassey behind the plate. And you ask why that's the case. Why does that relationship develop? And those of the A's will tell you that Hassey does an excellent job of keeping Welch's emotions in control and keeping him in a slower rhythm on the mound. Yeah, Bob Welch has been known to get a little jittery out on the mound. And Hassey is a, if you've ever met him, he's a slow talking, just doesn't take anything uh, at heart. And he just, uh, is able to keep Welch uh, solid on the pitcher's mound. They work well together. Now Robodeau on with the walk. Darrell Boston in his first start of 89. He's only been to the plate twice. But last year, hit two home runs off Bob Welch. And in this age of computerization, your certain Jeff Torborg knew that. Two to Boston. Just about everybody gets the computer printout right before the game starts. And they go over it. You take a look at Torborg and the White Sox dugout. Think about Jeff. He said, uh, even though this is my second time around, I'm a little bit more mature myself. I used to worry about the feelings of the players when I first took over. I was only 35 years old. That was when he took over from Frank Robinson and the Cleveland Indians. But he said, I, I used to worry about whether the players were mad at me. And he says, I don't worry about that anymore. Just fundamentals and winning ball games. Two and two now to Darrell Boston. The White Sox very hopeful that Walt Reniak, the new batting coach, can find the right switch to tap what they feel has been great potential in this young man. Watch most of the White Sox go through the batting order today, Bobby, and you'll see that the Charlie Lau, Walt Reniak influence on most every hitter in their lineup. That one hand off the bat when they swing. But Reniak, he only stresses one thing to these batters. First of all, Reniak is a big confidence builder. And if you believe in Walt, he believes in you, and he's almost like a guru. But he stresses keeping your head down, watching the ball, make contact with the bat. That's the one fundamental that he stresses. Right side, Phillips, nice range. And he gets Boston at first with the second out of the inning. Robodeau moves to second base. Not the quickest infield, so ground balls that may look like they're going to get through the hole in a place like Comiskey Park oftentimes slow down enough to give the infielders chance. Good play by Tony Phillips, who can play just about every position on the infield and the outfield. Well, you just have to have that uh, that kind of sense out on the uh, infield to be able to get the quick jump off the bat. Lions hitting the first pitch to Gallego. Double clutch and Lions beat it out. Gallego double clutched with that ball, and that was all that Lions needed to beat it out. Lions with good speed, and Gallego, watch him. He didn't have a good feel of the ball, and he double clutches, and that's all it took for Steve Lyons to beat that out. Pretty close at first. Score that an error on Gallego. Now, what impact does the runner moving in front Robodeau have on the shortstop on that play, Bobby? Well, I don't think that in that particular instance right there that it had it didn't have any effect as far as uh, blocking Gallego. His main concern was throwing the runner out at first base. It looked to me like Gallego was waiting for Steinbeck to get to first base, and that's the reason that. Uh, he double clutched. If you'll take a look at him here, he takes a look at the first base, and then uh, all of a sudden, it's like Steinbeck is not there. Now Eddie Williams making a hack at a fastball up and in, and it's one and one. So the White Sox with a chance here on the error by Gallego. Runners at first and third with two out. And Williams, who's off to a good start at the plate, 361. Ooh. 
And he Williams came out of the Met organization, went to Cleveland, where they hoped that he would break in for several years. He didn't make it. And the White Sox picked him up to shore up a position, third base, where the White Sox committed 46 errors last year. The Minnesota Twins set up all-time major league record last year. Their entire team committed only 84 errors. The White Sox had 46 at one position. Yeah, and third base last year, the White Sox used five different guys at third. They were just waiting for somebody to catch the ball. If you catch two in a row, you're automatically the everyday third baseman. This time last year, the White Sox were hopeful that another Williams, Kenny Williams, could make the move from center field to third base. That didn't work, but Steve Lyons spent most of the year there. Lyons running, and that's in the short right field, and B may not get there. He won't. All the way to third goes Lyons. As Robodeau scores to give the White Sox a 1-0 lead. A perfectly placed jam shot. And the White Sox taking advantage of the other team's mistake now, the Oakland A's, as that error allows Eddie Williams to pick up the base hit RBIs to, to put the White Sox out in front. With that wind blowing, it just uh, took that ball right down. Either Phillips nor Bean could catch up with it. And Phillips was moving towards second base with the runner from first moving, so all the elements conspired to work in Chicago's favor there. They reversed the tables on what the teams used to do against Chicago last year and also get yesterday as the White Sox didn't play that well in the field and Oakland took advantage of it. Hassey was out to talk to Bob Welch because probably Ozzie Ginn, he can do just about anything with a bat. He will bunt, he will push the ball to third, and also keep your eye on Williams at first base. Lions at third. Lansford playing on the grass cutout at third, and it's a foul for a strike. Lansford wary of the possibility of Guillen dropping one down. They shade Guillen towards left and left center in the outfield. Henderson swinging over towards left center. And now one and two to Guillen. A run in here in the second for the White Sox, and they lead one to nothing. Bob Welch has not had a lot of success in his Oakland career pitching on the road. He won a game earlier this week at Anaheim, and it was his first win on the road since May 20th of last year. You can see Ozzy. He's hacking at anything close to the plate, anything that he can actually get his bat on. Welch is doing the one thing today, Bobby, that his teammates love on a cold day early in the year. He has thrown a first pitch strike to nine of ten batters thus far. And he's working quickly, trying to keep the ball in play, keep his teammates from suffering frostbite. But several of the White Sox batters have been able to work some longer counts by fouling pitches off. Can always work in the favor of the opposing ball club because a pitcher like Welch, who is power pitcher, you throw a lot of pitches early in the ball game. You get into the middle innings and you lose something off that fastball by weakening. That'll wake you up. Believe it or not, I think Ozzy would have swung at that. <laughs> he was trying to. <laughs> Just a little bit more out, uh, uh, up and away from him. This is pretty close. And you can see Welch trying to get Ozzy again to chase that bad pitch, but that was just a little bit too far inside for Ozzy. Those are the ones that the batters really don't like, the ones that are coming right between the eyes from the moment that leaves the pitcher's hand. White Sox, 
He had a little glance there in Welch after that one moved him away, and the count goes full. White Sox were involved in a bench-clearing brawl opening day in California. Yvonne Calderon was hit with a pitch from the Angels' Bob McClure. And Guillen taps one. This is going to be a tough play. And Welch tries to come to the plate. He hits the runner. And it's 2-0 White Sox. It was the only play that Welch had. The only chance they had. And his throw hit Lyons as he crossed the plate. Good heads up play by the pitcher Bob Welch, as you mentioned, Ted. It is the only play that he had. It's a do or die play. And he just hits the runner in the back of the leg. But look how the Oakland, I mean, the uh, Chicago White Sox now have capitalized on that error by Gallego. Otherwise, the Oakland A's would be out of this inning with no run scored. And everybody is out. Barry Weinberg, the trainer, Tony LaRussi. He may have, Bob Welch may have hurt himself. He, he pulls up a little lame here. Let's, we'll get a chance to see it from a better angle. He's got to throw it off balance and underhanded, but he hits the turf. That's what he does. He goes down hard as he throws off balance. Weinberg has gone back to the dugout. I think he's going to be all right. Let me get a better look at it for this angle. As he throws the ball, he goes all the way up into the air and hits the turf the one thing you worry about there do you come down on your elbow or are your wrist or what have you but he's all right tony la Russa, you can just imagine what's going through his mind oh no not another guy well they got enough on the dl already the frustration of this inning for welch is that the White Sox have only hit one ball out of the infield in this inning, and that was a bloop in the very short right field by Williams. Yet they've scored two runs. Bottom line. <laughs> yeah, and Welch contributing it. The first man to reach base, a walk. And then the error in the infield that kept the inning going. And now Dave Gallagher bats, runners at first and second, two out, and two runs in. The third winningest pitcher in this decade. I think that's a fact that would surprise many. He trails Jack Morris and Dave Steve by a rather healthy margin. Well, he's just got outstanding stuff with that. 90 plus fastball but like I said earlier when you've got a fastball up in that miles per hour as you take a look at the graphic there or Steve and Welch when you can spot that fastball on the inside and the outside corner and then try to backdoor him with the breaking ball you can really keep these hitters off balance oh that's it deep to left way back and a three run homer for Dave Gallagher of the late Bill Beck. Fireworks. And it has erupted for Chicago and backfired for Oakland. An inning that should have ended with no run scoring. And the White Sox have put a five spot up. That was not one of Welch's better fastballs. It was almost like a lay in fastball for a strike. Gallagher, he just lays into it himself. Right there it is in the wheelhouse. And you can see that Riniac swing from Gallagher with that hand, that top hand coming off the bat. Hey, you look at a guy, and if you're Welch, you say he's only hit five home runs in his career. You don't expect him to take a pitch like that on a day like this and drill at that ball. As you said, Bobby, the location was terrible. 2-0 and out of base. Now the White Sox have not seen many innings. 
innings like this in recent years. They were next to last in the American League in runs scored last year. And with so much of their pop missing due to injuries right now, Jeff Corbord doesn't expect to see five run innings. Particularly against the pitcher of Welch's caliber. Yeah, and especially if you take a look at Tony La Russa, he's a little bit concerned at this point. He's got his big guns out. Pascal, Fisk, Walker. And Welch is just not, he, he, he's not throwing the fastball. Now you gotta wonder, did Welch really hurt himself when he tried to make that play towards home and he fell on his right side? He's not popping the fastball like he was uh, prior to that. his emotions have often gotten the better of him on the mound and that's something that Oakland pitching coach Dave Duncan has spent a lot of time working with Welch on during his time in Oakland keeping composed on the mound when things don't go well ninth man to bat in the inning is Calderon and he takes ball one fairly full pitching staff. Welch not happy with the call there from Larry Barnett at ball two. They carried 11 pitchers through the first two weeks. They changed that only today when Gene Nelson went on the disabled list. And now after walking Baines, he has gone 3-0 and to Calderon. A lot of times, teams early in the season will carry more pitchers depending on their schedule for the first month. Four-pitch walk to Calderon. The bullpens here at Comiskey Park are partially hidden, but I can't see anybody throwing in the open bullpen. The thing about Bob Welch, he just, he's not popping the fastball like he was prior to this. It looks like he's trying to aim the fastball more than, than pitching now. It's like he's just looking for a strike anywhere. And as we saw that shot of Tony La Russa, you saw Dave Duncan getting on the phone. And as that occurs, now there will be some activity in the Oakland bullpen. It's to Marullo, who began the inning being called out on strikes on three pitches. pitch to him as a strike. And he pops that one up. Short right center. Bean is there. But the inning ends. A nightmare for Oakland. Five Chicago runs. The, a key error by Gallego opened the door and Gallagher slammed it shut with a three-run homer. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. is brought to you by Pontiac. We build excitement. And by new Focare for a smoother running engine. Along with Bobby Mercer, Ted Robinson joining you at Comiskey Park in Chicago. The first game of our Game of the Week doubleheader. And a five-run second inning for the Chicago White Sox, giving them the early lead. But the toughest thing for Jerry Royce is to sit through that long second inning while his club was batting and have to come back out on a chilly day and pitch again. I'm sure Jerry found the clubhouse during that long inning. <laughs> the hand packs, a couple of jackets on. Starts Ron Hassey with a ball. It's the kind of game that Jerry Royce likes because being the control pitcher that he is, it gives him some leeway fly ball by Hassey to straightaway center. Dave Gallagher has it, and there's one away. What I mean by that is that Royce can come right at these hitters, just like Hassey right now. He doesn't want to walk anybody. He doesn't have to hit the corner. And it'll also cut down on some of the activity that the Oakland A's probably would use against Royce. And I'm talking about the base running ability of Tony Phillips and Javier and what have you. Out of the top of the order and Phillips who began the game with a walk. Now, 
Athletics had their leadoff man reach base in both the first and second innings, but did not score either time. The A's scored 800 runs last year. That was second to Boston in the league. All right, now Baltimore jumping out in front of the Red Sox at Fenway in the fourth inning. And Texas off to an eight and one start, leading Detroit in the fourth inning. And Toronto jumping early on Brett Saberhagen for five to two lead. Check swing over Lions head and a base hit for Phillips. Tony Phillips with a one-out single here in the third. That will bring Stan Javier to the plate. Talking about Texas, Bobby, what everybody in the American League West was concerned about coming into this season was not letting Oakland do what they did last year, which was really run away from the division with that long winning streak they had in late April. Funny thing how these divisions turn around like the Eastern Division three or four years ago, how stout they were, and how they used to really just handle the Western Division. It's turned around with the Western Division as the better division of the two. Now with Texas and Minnesota, the Oakland A's. I'll tell you, Texas is they have added some offense with Palmero and, and Franco, and of course the addition of Nolan Ryan and Bobby Witt getting back on track. Pittsburgh jumping out on 6'10 left-hander Randy Johnson. Montreal 5-0 in the third inning there. Two-strike count to Javier. Would you like to face a 6'10 left-hander? I wouldn't like to face any left-hander. <laughs> never did and never six will. Ten. Well, I won't have to face him anymore. Do you ever think you'd see the day and you have a 6'10 inch pitcher? I thought 6'1 was tall. Two and two now to Javier. And he probably comes from the side, too. He's a side armor, right? <laughs> By the way, a first base. Who's the tallest guy you ever hit against? Do you remember? Oh, I think Steve Hamilton. That's what, 6'7? Yeah, Hambone was about, yeah, he was about 6'7. Maybe 6'6, 6'7. Six, 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 Javier hits a double play ball. The White Sox turn it. Nicely done. Guillen, the Lions the first. And after two and a half, it's 5 nothing White Sox. This is one of those April baseball days that looks so warm, but is really so cold. Shades of candlestick. <laughs> you remember those, though? Oh, do I? <laughs> you chilly nights there. And the sunshine on the field, it actually is a nice afternoon. But for those... Uh, who are covered, and most of the fans here at Comiskey Park are in the shade. It is a, a chilly afternoon. Billy Joe Robodeau with a two-strike count here as we start the bottom of the third. The White Sox leading five to nothing. A five-run second inning off Bob Welch, and there he will backdoor breaking ball in the outside corner, and he gets Robodeau looking. Second strikeout for Welch, who walked three batters in that five-run inning, in which all five were under. Yeah, that's un unlike Bob Welch to do that. Madero Boston hit a ground ball to second his first time. It's interesting to look back at the graphic that we had on in the, the previous inning about Welch being the third winningest pitcher in this decade. This is not going to go down in the baseball annals, Bobby, as a decade of pitching. If Jack Morris does not win 16 games this year, this decade will have the winningest pitcher with the fewest wins in baseball history. Hard to believe. Al Newhauser won 170 games in the 40s, the winningest pitcher in that decade. Boston. We talk about the hitting. 
and the, and the pitching and how the cycles go. And there's a walk. The fourth walk issued by Welch. And right now, let's go to Marv Albert in New York for an update. Thank you, Ted. At Fenway in Boston, Rick Cerrone with a second RBI single of the game. A base hit bringing home Dwight Evans, and the Red Sox are now trailing the Orioles 4-2 to two in the fifth inning. Let's get back to Ted and Bob in Chicago. Here it is, 5-0 White Sox, and Darryl Boston at first base with one out. Welch now has walked four and struck out two. Boston has uh, decent speed at first base. That pitch missing the Lions for ball one. But what it does for the White Sox is that the Jeff Torborg and the White Sox, they can afford to take a few more chances now that they're out in front five to nothing. Cuts down the chances that the Oakland A's can take. at second. Well, now the Oak, I mean the uh, Chicago White Sox with another man in scoring position and another head first slide in at second. Foul by Lions, it's two and one. On his follow through there, the, maybe one of the more exaggerated examples of the Walt Riniak influence. Well, you know, it looks like that you're only swinging with one hand, but that's basically not true. Walt wants the hitters to keep their head down and on the baseball, on the bat, watch the uh, ball meet the bat, but you have to make contact with both hands and then let that top hand come off of the bat. And the reason that he stresses that is, is the fact that you get more extension on your ball. You saw Gallagher when he hit the ball out of the ballpark in left field for that three-run home run. He got a lot of extension out of him. They have a sign at the end of the dugout as the batters are coming out to the on deck circle. So keep your head down. Fighting the sun and the wind there, Lansford has it for out number two. For an example, Ted, when Charlie Lau was alive and he was the hitting instructor for the Yankees, I had been with the Yankees in the 60s when they had the 296. Uh, ports down the right field line. I developed a tremendous top hand where I would hook the ball down the right field line. And when I got traded away, I kept that same top hand and it cost me a lot of home runs because I'd get overspin on the ball and when I'd hit it out into right center field, the ball would die. But when I came back to the Yankees, Charlie Lau told me, he said, hey, you know, you're smothering every ball that you hit. You need to get more extension. And then Charlie started telling me about uh, throwing the hand off the top hand off the bat. And I got more extension out of it. It really helped. Back up the middle by Eddie Williams and through for a base hit. Austin will score. And the White Sox lead six to nothing. And so there is a case of the stolen base paying off as that allows the White Sox to get a run. And Eddie Williams is knocked in two. And the sign of a good ball club is when you get those key two out base hits with men in scoring position. And any time you can add another run to the board. Hit the breaking ball. Nice try by Tony Phillips as Gallego has to jump over him. Pitch to Guillen missing for a ball. Six runs off Welch one of them earned. They haven't hit him particularly hard. But Tony LaRusse is staying with him. Again, no activity in his bullpen. He had Todd Burns throwing briefly in the second inning. That one is slapped 
to Gallego to end the inning. But the White Sox add to their lead with one run on one hit. And through three, it is 6 nothing Chicago. Baseball's oldest park, Comiskey Park in Chicago, apparently on its last legs. They claimed here that the home opener yesterday was the next to last that they'll ever have here. That may be optimistic, but they've begun to clear ground right across the street for what will be a new stadium built very much in the style and tradition of Comiskey Park. I can't believe the construction that is already going on here in this area with the, the demolition of the houses and buildings uh, just across the street. Henderson with a foul pop outside first. Robodeau has it burned out. Some people are not too happy with some of the buildings that are being knocked down because they used to go there after the game. Yes. <laughs> Get a taste or two. A few of your traditional establishments yes. have fallen into the steel wrecking ball. There are still some hurdles to be cleared here for that project. In fact, the story in the newspapers here in Chicago this morning that the bids by the builders to construct the stadium have come in $30 million over budget. That's what you might call a small hurdle. Well, I think June of last year is when the governor stepped in to help keep this ball club in Chicago. They were on their way to Florida, to the uh, Tampa-St. Petersburg area. Those last-minute efforts to keep a ball club in the Illinois. Two and one now to Terry Steinbach. So many great memories here at Comiskey. I always remember back in the early days, six, in the 60s, when Tommy John and Gary Peters used to pitch here. When you walked up towards home plate, there was so much mud up there you couldn't hardly stand it. You couldn't get out of it even if you made contact with a baseball. Steinbach in the left center field, but you're not going to hit a ball out of there today, not the left center. Wind right now is whipping straight in from there and it holds it up for Gallagher and that's out number two. This telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball. It may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. First game of our doubleheader today, the Twins and Yankees were rained out in New York second game most of you will see the Mets and the Cardinals some of you will see the Astros and Dodgers Ernie Lansford now five out of six in this series and that one may get out Boston back and it is off the wall Lansford into second with a double he really cranked that right into the teeth of the win which knocked it down and kept it in the park. Now Jerry Roy is not walking anybody. Trying to get ahead of these hitters as you take a look at the nervousness as Carney Lansford keeps those hands moving. That's his timing mechanism. And the only way that actually you're going to get the ball in the gap is to hit it on the line, and that's what Lansford did. He hit the ball in the air today with that wind blowing in. It's just going to suck right back up. So Dave Parker now will bat with two outs and Lansford at second. Just 55 runs batted in for Parker last year. Became almost exclusively a designated hitter late in the year, playing the field just three times after the All-Star break. with Canseco having yet to play this year and with McGuire having missed five games already. Oakland is still scoring just under five runs a game. One thing Tony La Russa took pride in last year was that he felt his club was much more than the Bash brothers, that they could score runs in many different ways and they could survive 
even though they didn't have to last year, they could survive periods like this where they have to play without the home run hitters. And they did. They won 104 games and only lost 58. But they're concerned about uh, Jose Canseco. A lot of people feel that Canseco will not be back before the All-Star break. That's the toughest injury for a hitter, the wrist. Gallagher catching the pop in short center. And after three and a half, Jerry Royce spinning the shutout. Six nothing White Sox. This day in baseball history may have been the most important day in the history of the game. In 1947, when Jackie Robinson played his first game for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Hard to imagine for us in this generation what baseball must have been like before Jackie Robinson. Dave Gallagher, a big blow in this game, a three-run homer to left field down the line on Bob Welch in the second inning. Capping off a five-run frame, all unearned. Sure, Gallagher and uh, Riniak have a lot to talk about. Lansford throws out Gallagher and there's one away. I don't say that because of Gallagher's home run, his three run home run. But the, he is the inventor of the device called the stride tutor. And it's something where he hooks onto his feet to help control his stride. And he invented that. And understand the sales last year were enormous because of the fact that he had a good year. He's a pleasant surprise to the White Sox, the type of player that can get buried in the minor league system and come to a team with a particular need and get a chance to play, which is what Gallagher did and performed quite well. 2-0 to Harold Baines. I mentioned this is not a good home run park to believe that Harold Baines needs eight home runs to become the all-time leading home run hitter in Comiskey Park history. With 90. Bill Melton is the more home runs in this park than any player at 90. It's almost unbelievable when you think about Yankee Stadium and their short right field pitch. And even though the this ballpark is 347 down both lines and 409 in center field. They used to they used to be open area out there in center field. They put that fence up to make it 409. It used to be a lot further than that. And of course, then you get a day with the wind blowing in. Well, Bob Welch, even though only one run has earned, it has clearly not been a typical Bob Welch day in the five walks of illustrating that. He'll pitch to Calderon now, who has lined out to right field and walked. And Welch now has thrown 72 pitches with one out of the fourth inning. First pitch up in the air. Actually, the wind will keep this in the infield. And Phillips has it for out number two. Of course, hitting is more mental than anything else. And as a hitter, when you go to the plate, knowing that you've got a big ballpark to hit in with the wind blowing in, your first concern is uh, not hitting the ball up in the air. And if you do hit the ball in the air, you want to hit it on the line, so you go up there trying to pound the ball into the dirt. Hit it on the ground each time. Give yourself a better chance. That's not basically the best way to approach it, but... And Marillo lines this to right field, but right to Billy B. A lot of first pitch hacking going on right now. And after four, it is six nothing White Sox. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Here at Comiskey Park in Chicago, the White Sox leading six to nothing as we go to the fifth inning. Second game of the doubleheader coming up today. Most of you will see Dwight Gooden pitch the Mets in St. Louis against the Cardinals, or some of you will see Oral Hershiser pitch for the Dodgers in Los Angeles against the Astros. Billy Bean on the first pitch in his short right center. 
and Baines makes the catch, and there's one away. This is, again, a kind of a typical April game now. Bobby is getting the later innings, and everybody's going up there and hacking. And Jerry Royce is making these uh, batters hit the baseball to get on. Uh, he just wants to get ahead of them. Start them off with a strike. And a pitcher like Jerry Royce, he knows who the big men are in this Oakland A lineup. And he'll throw the ball purposely upstairs just a little bit more than he normally would, knowing that these guys cannot hit the ball out of the ballpark. They will hit it in the air, which gives their infielders and outfielders a chance to catch the ball. Playing the elements. Sure that Jeff Torborg and pitching coach Sammy Ellis are hoping their young pitchers, Melito Perez, Sean Hillegas, watch Royce on a day like this and learn something. Well, that's one of the things that uh, Torborg and Sammy are proud of is the fact that Royce is 39 years old. He's been in the big leagues 18 years. And he will indeed, he will no doubt indeed help these young pitchers talking to them in the clubhouse on the sidelines and then set an example as he pitches in the ball game. The other promising young pitcher the White Sox have who they figured to be in the rotation this year is Jack McDowell, the former Stanford standout, but he is starting the year in the minor leagues after having a bit of a tough time during spring training. White Sox added a guy a lot of people in the American League love, Eric King from Detroit. Great arm. He came in a trade late in spring training and moved right into the starting rotation. Topped out to Eddie Williams. And he throws out Gallego for out number two. took over 200 ground balls a day this winter knowing he was going to have a chance to play here in Chicago. That was a routine ground ball and he ended up throwing the ball off balance almost threw it in the dirt at first. And some of the things that they uh, watch from the dugout and when the inning is over with they'll remind him of that when you, you can get yourself set it on the ground ball make sure that you do and try not to throw the ball off balance if you don't have to. I don't think anybody that I've seen in the early part of this baseball season, Bobby, has drawn more second looks than Ron Hassey. His weightlifting regimen is, is like a whole different person. If you go in a clubhouse and look at these open A's, they look more like the Chicago Bears or the uh, Los Angeles Raiders. I mean, they are huge. And every one of these guys lift weights. Ron Hassey has turned his He's turned his body around, for one thing. I've never seen Hassey look better in a uniform. Hassey has that strong upper body now. Ground ball fielded by Robodeau, and it's another easy inning for Rice, who has now retired seven of the last eight, and he cruises through the middle innings with a 6-0 lead. What time is kickoff, Bobby? <laughs> Make sure they think they're coming to see the Bears today. This is the day to be in the sun. Now we go to the bottom of the fifth here in Comiskey. Six to nothing, White Sox lead. Right now, this is a welcome sight for the White Sox after yesterday's problems when they played poorly in the field at their home opener. Lost seven to four. Then saw the power in the stadium go out in the eighth inning. Bean with a line on this. And there's one away. Because of a fire nearby at a tire warehouse near the ballpark here that cut off power in the entire ballpark in the eighth inning. In fact, Jeff Torborg had his post-game press conference in the dugout. And Matt Marullo, we saw right before the game, they shot off the fireworks here. They couldn't do it because of the scoreboard being out when he hit his first major league home run. A 
They may have been glad. There you, there you take a look at that young catcher, Matt Marullo. His grandfather played for the Chicago Cubs and played shortstop for the Cubs. I understand his name was, uh, he had a nickname, Boots. And he booted a few balls at shortstop, so they nicknamed him Boots. So he comes from a uh, baseball family. One and one to Boston. Those baseball purists who miss those nicknames will be warmed by that story. We had Boots Day at one time. Back in the early 70s uh, on the Yankee Ball Club, we used to have nicknames for everybody. They used to call me Lemon. because They thought my head looked like a lemon. It was round. Gallego charging this one. Has to hurry. Boston runs very well, and he guns him down. You don't think you want to get too heavy into explaining too many of the no. reasons behind nicknames. <laughs> but I do want to mention that they didn't name me Lemon because I was a sour guy, just because of the shape of my head. See, and I, as I sit next to you here, I can't understand that at all. <laughs> Lions with a ground ball to Phillips, so a quick inning for Welch. And at this stage of the game, he welcomes that as well. So we're through five in Chicago, and it's 6 nothing White Sox. Now, the, I the idea there, first of all, is to put the ball in your left hand and then jam it back in between your index <laughs> finger and your middle finger. I'd start working on that split finger now. That's what it's all about. If we go to the sixth inning here in Chicago. The White Sox breezing with a 6 to nothing lead. Jerry Royce has done his job after getting the early lead. He's thrown strikes, put the ball in play, and kept his team out of the field. This is Jerry Royce's uh, situation, having a lead like this and knowing that the bashers are out of this Oakland A lineup, McGuire and Canseco. A little bit surprising on a little stat for Jerry Royce. Uh, Royce and Mel Pappas are the only two pitchers in baseball history to win 200 or more games without the benefit of a 20-game win season. Well, as baseball changes, players are in better condition later in their careers. You'll see more of that. Don Sutton won 300 games and I believe had one 20-win season. Jerry has won uh, 18 games uh, three times in his career. Won 13 last year for the White Sox. He pitched one game at the end of the 1969 season. And Phillips draws the walk. Second issued by Royce. They've both been to Phillips. Right now to New York and Marv Albert. All right, Ted, at Fenway in Boston was Phil Bradley for the Orioles going opposite field, extending the lead to 5-2 over the Red Sox. RBI triple for Bradley in the sixth inning. Orioles five, Red Sox two. Baltimore knocking out one-time Oriole Mike Boddicker. Back to Ted Robinson in Chicago. Thank you, Marv. Stan Javier standing in. Sox having some pitching woes here early in the season. Their closer Lee Smith has been bothered with a groin injury and the starting pitching has been a little shaky as well. And the pitch to Javier is a ball. But back to what we were saying about Royce being a you know, pitched in the 60s. There are only three pitchers active in baseball right now who pitched a game in the 60s. Tommy John. Nolan Ryan and Jerry Royce. I'd say all three have a pretty good shot to pitch next year in the 90s. I faced all three of them, too. Of course, the two lefties, Tommy John and Jerry Royce, that's understandable since I was the left-handed batter. But when I finally got to face uh, Nolan Ryan, a right-handed pitcher, it was always in the twilight. 
It was always five o'clock and you couldn't see the ball anyway. And he was throwing at about 100 miles an hour. That's how they uh, like to schedule those games for him. Towering pop into straightaway center field and being pushed in by the wind. And Gallagher has it for the out. So are you saying you never had the Nolan Ryan flu, huh? Well, I mean, I couldn't hit left-handers very well. And then when I finally got the Ryan-hander out there, it was in, five, in the 5 o'clock shadows. And even though Nolan was throwing that 100-mile-an-hour heat, you don't stand in there very uh, lackadaisical. I mean, you're in there ready to move any time because even when you can see a Nolan Ryan real well, that 100-mile-an-hour fastball is not uh, something that you want to see every day. Dave Henderson is 0 for 2. Ryan pitched the other night in the twilight in Milwaukee and had, for a 42-year-old, an astonishing outing. Two walks, 15 strikeouts, and one hit ball for eight innings. And one of the hardest curveballs in all of baseball. Henderson hits that deep to left, and it is gone. Dave Henderson grilling one deep to left field for his second home run of the season. And suddenly, with one swing, Oakland is in the game again. At 6-2. Henderson jumping all over this pitch. But the runner on at first base, a little cut fastball, only it didn't cut enough in on the hands of Henderson. He was able to extend those arms and hands. And Henderson has one of those unique home run trots that if you've just thrown the pitch, you tend not to appreciate very much. Steinbach rolling it to Guillen, and that's the second out. Anderson hit very well here last year, hit well against the White Sox. Three homers and knocked in 11 runs off them. And that gets the White Sox bullpen going. Lefty Steve Rosenberg throwing. With two outs here in the sixth. Royce has not thrown many pitches. He came into the city. Needing just 56 pitches to get through the first five innings. Rosenberg and Lansford in the center field. Gallagher broke back at first and then comes on to play it. So the inning is over. Dave Henderson with a two-run homer gets Oakland on the board, but it's still 6-2 White Sox. The elusive Walt Riniak has surfaced. Spent the last few years with the Red Sox and now to the White Sox, where he is the hitting coordinator. And he has worked long and hard with Eddie Williams, the man at the plate here. Of course, the White Sox having a plan for their franchise and his ball club, and they needed to improve on their hitting. So they got Reniak to come over. It's been 12 seasons with the Red Sox, and the Red Sox only led the American League in batting six times under Reniak. So that's got to be a big plus. They also wanted to improve on their pitching. They got Jeff Pulborg, the manager, who certainly knows a lot about pitching. Spent nine years as the Yankee bullpen coach. Williams popping it up to Phillips for the out, one away. There's a lot of concern in Boston amongst the players on that team, especially those that were the real devotees of Reniak as to how they'd react to his leaving. The only time will tell. I'll tell you, it is, it is a tremendous amount of relief to a hitter when you have a lot of confidence in your hitting instructor and you can go to him at any time, any place, and talk to him about hitting. Ian beats it right to the dirt in front of home plate and quickly two outs here in the sixth. The hitting instructor is more or less a, more of a pacifier, but if you believe in the guy, that's all you need because he is more or less working on your head along with your mechanics up there. And Reniak is uh, no stranger to work. 
scoreboard was telling us what in spring training some of the guys said uh, well we would like to have some extra batting practice and he said well okay be here tomorrow morning i like the sun rises at about 6 45 and they were ready to get after it gallagher a three-run homer in the second in three at-bats The game is, is so mental now, and it's not just hitters, it's pitchers. Bruce Suter had one man, Mike Rourke, that could straighten his mechanics out. Well, did Suter ever revolutionize a pitch or not? Woo. Well, that split finger fastball. Of course, that, I call that the pitch of the 80s. It has turned a lot of guys' uh, careers around, learning how to throw that pitch. Question is, will it, will it carry into the 90s? We'll see. Three up and three down, and Bob Welch is cruising. He's now retired eight straight through six. It's six nothing, six two White Sox, and we'll be back after these messages from your local. The game of the week is brought to you by your Toyota dealer. Whatever car or truck you choose, you'll love the quality. Who could ask for anything more? And by Mastercard. You can count on Mastercard to help you master the moment. Along with Bobby Mercer, Ted Robinson at Comiskey Park in Chicago. The Twins and Yankees raid out today, so you've been watching the White Sox and the A's. It is 6-2 Chicago as we go to the seventh. And Jerry Royce pulling the string on Dave Parker for strike one. Normally in a game such as this, a Dave Parker, as he walks to the plate, you try to give Jerry Royce a chance to get wild. You have to have men on the base pass in order to knock them in. They're behind four to behind four runs, six to two. But Parker going up there swinging at that big curveball. But that's changed in baseball too, hasn't it, Bobby? It sure Teams, has. So many more hitters are aggressive now. That ball's going to drop for a hit in the left center field. So Parker on a two-one pitch singles off the left-hander. And the A's have a leadoff man on. They've had the leadoff man on four times now in their seven innings against Jerry Rice. Now, I know for a fact that you were a very patient hitter against Nolan Ryan, weren't you? You were always trying to work those deep counts. Well, Nolan wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> See, nothing gets by well, our I, crack research yeah, staff. I was wondering what you were getting into. Those are big, fat zeros. How close see, to the truth? I, how close I, to the but, truth is that? See, I explained <laughs> my whole problem against Nolan Ryan way before that graphic showed showed up. I couldn't see Nolan. If I could have seen uh, his fastball, I'd have been all right. But at least you were there. I you was didn't get there. that Ryan. No. Though, did you? <laughs> I tell you what, you have really got to commend him because 42 years old and still firing that fastball in the 90s. And Torborg is on his way to the mound. said that don't know if Royce has felt as to be tiring he hasn't thrown many pitches but this is the slow walk that means you're gonna make a change and that's exactly it there may be something physically wrong with Royce but the sign is going to the bullpen and the White Sox are going to be bringing in right-hander Barry Jones to relieve Royce. This relief break is brought to you by Rollins. Last year, Roadblades Relief Man Award went to Dennis Eckersley of Oakland in the American League and Cincinnati's John Franco in the National League. During this season, we'll be tracking the Rollades point standings based on wins, losses, saves, and blown saves. Right-hander Barry Jones, 26 years of age, beginning his first full season with the White Sox. He came over late last year in August of last year from Pittsburgh and the deal that sent Dave LaPointe to the Pirates there are Jones's numbers this year and he is pitching to Luis Polonia who is batting for Billy Bean well, that'll release some of these left-handed batters still on the open A bench and Polonia free swinger up at the plate most of the time Slashing it over Eddie Williams down the left field line. And the ball got by Boston momentarily. And a 
series of fans interfering with the ball tumbling into the field, and that robs Oakland of a run. Let's see how the umpires rule this. Parker is going to the dugout. They may let that play stand, and Polonia be at third base with a triple. Judgment play on the yeah. umpires, Park. Now, whether they thought Parker would score anyway, whether Boston would have come up with the baseball or not. And now Torborg out to talk to Larry Barnett, the crew chief. That's exactly what he wants to know. There's no question, I don't believe, that Parker would have scored because the ball had gotten by Boston by the time he would have run it down and Polonia would have been at third base. I wouldn't be surprised if Polonia wouldn't have scored. Watch this ball going down the left field line. Boston got too close. He actually misplayed that ball. And now there it is rolling up against the uh, side of the wall with the fans interfering. And a judgment call made on the umpire's part to let Parker score all the way from first base. But Boston got too close to the ball. He tried to cut it off. The ball was already past him. Well, that's a break for the Oakland A's. So, Luis Polonia, we'll see the fans interfering again. Yesterday, we had a fan fall out of the right field bleachers on the warning track during the game. Don't know if that comes with the price of admission or not. And here, now in a game that is now 6-3 Chicago with a runner at third, no one out, is Felix Jose, pinch hitting for Mike Gallego. Switch hitter, rookie. He won a job at spring training, but has struggled in the early going. Well, he's young, and he's just not patient at the plate yet. And LaRusso wanted to set him down for a couple of days, let him gather some thoughts, learn something. Coburg may be turning this lineup around and make it a solid left-handed hitting lineup, and he... We saw before he brought uh, Jones in that he had the left-hander Rosenberg warming up in the bullpen. Once they do that, he may come back with the left-hander. We'll have to wait and see. Of course, the White Sox closer has been Bobby Thigpen, but he had a terrible spring and a rough outing early in the regular season. They feel he is straightened out now. There's a nice block by Marillo. Jeff Torborg pointed that out about Murillo. He said yesterday, he was a kid that everybody questions his glove, and yesterday he blocked a dozen balls in the dirt. A dozen that he kept in play, prevented runners from moving up on him. We'll see a block right here, and this is important because it holds the runner at third. If Marullo doesn't get in front of that one, Polonia will score from third. Valuable playing time this youngster is getting now. Jones with a big strikeout. They got Jose to chase a ball away from him. Jose, he's just caught in between right now. You can see that. He, he doesn't want to swing at a bad pitch, but he doesn't want to swing and uh, hold up on a good pitch either. And he's just, uh, he's all messed up at the plate. His timing is off. And he's feeling for the ball. First strikeout for the White Sox pitching staff today. It is the first out in this seventh inning. And we'll bring Ron Hassey to the plate now to bat against the right-hander. It's an important run there at third base. It would bring Oakland within two here in the seventh inning. And Hassey is just trying to do that. Put the ball in play to get that run home. He does, and it's a six to four ball game. Almost like a sacrifice swing by Hassey, just trying to put it in play. He got fooled on that breaking ball, and Hassey was way out in front of it. But the only place he wouldn't have scored a run from third was hitting it back to the pitcher, popping it up on the infield. And now Phillips bats with two outs and no one on, and two runs in the inning. Phillips been on base all three times. And he's 
those years when he started for Oakland. Very good leadoff hitter. And on base percent. And right here he's thrown out. The A's still scored two in the inning to get within two. And again this season, we'll be taking a look during our game of the week at baseball's unusual personalities, some of the real characters of the Luis Polonia staying in to play left field for Oakland. Stan Javier moves to right field. And the new shortstop is Walt Weiss. Those changes as we go to the bottom of the seventh, and it's now a 6-4 to four lead for Chicago. Welch is still on the mound. And suddenly what seemed to be something of a questionable decision earlier in the game by Tony La Russa to stay with Welch now has borne some benefit. And Jerry Royce is out, who was basically in control up until he was taken out of the ball game. And Bob Welch having the problems that uh, he had in the second inning. But he has settled down. And the Oakland A's are creeping up on the Chicago White Sox. Welch has retired 10 of the last 11 batters. And has not allowed a hit since Eddie Williams singled in a run with two outs in the third inning. communicating to slow down a bit again. Welch was getting into that rapid fire rhythm. Three and two the count out of Baines. I've seen a lot of that this afternoon. Three and two counts and a lot of White Sox batters. But this being a cool day, that'll help Welch a little bit because his stamina Talking about discipline earlier, Bobby, and how so many hitters now are more aggressive. And I don't know if it's Walt Raniac's influence or not, but there's no question in the American League over the last couple of years, the most disciplined hitting team has been the Red Sox. Well, he, he stresses that because he says you can't hit a pitch unless you can at least reach it in the strike zone. He wants these guys to be patient and know the strike zone when they walk to the plate. Of course, when you keep your head down, you can see the ball off. That's a fair ball. second base nobody out Calderon if he doesn't pick up a base hit at least he's trying to move that runner to third with less than two outs
check swing do the job type of swing. Well, a caller on excuse me swing. You go back in the dugout and say, how'd you like that, Skip? I did the job. Now Marullo bats with a chance to bring her own home. Old-time batter here, Bobby. No batting gloves. How many guys you see that anymore? With a cold day. Just about everybody uses at least one batting glove. I started using them. Oh, I would say back in the late 70s, but I, I never did use I never did use a glove when I started out. Infield in for Oakland, and it's a 2-0 and count to Marula. Of course, everything is a matter of feel for the batter. You got to feel the bat in your hand. It's got to feel good to you in your hand. If you start using a glove and that feels good to you, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great sight, though, in this era of gloves and wristbands and armbands. Here's a kid who's just doing it like he did it in the sandlot. Picking up the bat with his bare hands. You can see the respect that the American League pitchers have already gotten for this youngster, Matt Marullo. Welch is being extremely careful with him, with the runner on at third base. Another conference at the mound. If he were to walk Marullo with one out, they have another slow-footed player coming up next in Robido. They could be hoping for a ground ball. Turn two to end the inning. There's Robido on deck. 3-0 and oh here. And a walk. Hassey went out to talk to us to say, hey, don't give in to this guy. You can try to make a perfect pitch on the outside corner, and we'll get to the with the next batter. And pitching coach Dave Duncan now goes to the mound. Of course, Cataray is warming up in the bullpen. He's a left-hander. Well, they, I guess they have a choice of matchups here from open standpoint. They keep Welch in to pitch to Robido, or if they bring Cataray in, they figure they're going to see Rod Kittle. Six to four White Sox lead here in the bottom of the seventh, trying to add the lead. And the guy who played for Tony La Russa right here on the championship club in 83. Very happy to be back, Rod Kittle. Gary, Indiana. Now those might be insulated gloves he has on there. Those might not be batting gloves. And here's Robodeau batting. Infield back looking for the ground ball. Throws a strike. Weiss and Phillips hoping they can turn two to end the inning. Missing, and it's 1-1. One, one. Two runs in the sixth and two in the seventh by Oakland. Adding some mystery here to the game, and it's now a 6 4 Chicago lead. Now, one and two, and Welch figures here. You figure Robito has to be looking for split fingers. Well, Welch is trying to keep the ball down to get Robito to hit the ball on the ground. That's the, the chance that he would like to take in getting out of this inning. With the double play, that's the pitcher's best friend, especially in a spot like this. He's been down and away, down and away on Robodeau on every pitch. Two and two now. Boston is on deck. 
see if the White Sox start, even though Murillo doesn't run well. They may start him to try and stay out of the double play. And Welch concerned about that. This will probably and see what Murillo is going to do. Excuse me, Ted. This will probably be Welch's last batter, depending on what happens right here. Runner does not go, and he walks. So the bases are loaded with one out. Darrell Boston is the batter. And Bobby is right on the money as Tony La Russa on his way out to remove Bob Welch. We're in the seventh inning. The White Sox have the bases loaded. One out, leading six to four. We'll return in a moment. Go to the bullpen for 27-year-old left-hander Greg Cattery in his second full year in the big leagues. Outstanding year last year in spot action for Oakland, five and two with three saves. This year he's see the numbers are a little ugly for the early going. He's pitched three and two-thirds innings and given up three hits and walked four batters, which has been his early season problem. But tough on lefties, Bobby, and that's what the A's won here. Lefties hit only 198 against Cateray last season. And he's going to face Darrell Boston here with the bases loaded. Well, Tolborg has his option. He could bring Kittle to the plate, the right-handed batter, let Kittle play the outfield. But the matchup, and it looks like Tolborg, no doubt, will stay with Darrell Boston. And he has to be thinking defense that situation. Kittle has played a couple of times in the outfield for him. And he says that Kittle will play some outfield during the course of the 89 season. And there's the Kittle. Of course, you're right. Uh, he may be thinking about the uh, defensive liabilities. But hey, if you pick up four runs, uh, you've got yeah. a little room to make some miscues. But like you have said earlier, uh, They've got high hopes for this youngster. It shows a lot of confidence, uh, Torborg does, in letting Boston hit against Cattery. And he hits it to left field and well. Polonia on the ball, slicing away from him, makes the catch, but tagging up and scoring is Schaefer to give the White Sox a 7 4 lead. Marullo, also on an alert play, tags and moves to third. Polonia does not have throwing arm and the White Sox knowing that and their scouting reports take advantage of it. Well Boston not wasting any time he saw the pitch that he liked and he hit it good and on the line to left field Polonia is there. The wind is also there to knock it down for Polonia as the runner tags and scores. That's a big run at this point of the game. And now with two outs moving over to third base. Robito staying at first. And Lyons making the butt. Went at it, says Larry Barnett. That's a strike. Very strange line for Bob Welch. Six and one-third innings. Six hits, seven walks, and two strikeouts. Right now, two of the runs earned at White Sox had to love that run score to give him a three-run cushion going in the last two innings. I like the fact that Torborg stayed with Boston. He showed a lot of confidence in this young man hitting against the left-hander, Cateray. Hard thrower, Cateray just blows the fastball on the outside corner. One and two. You, know, you establish something between the player and the manager, and Boston won't be looking over his shoulder all the time thinking that he's going to be jerked every time a left-hander comes into a ball game, no matter what the score is. This is a young ball club, and Torborg's the first-year manager here with the White Sox. Good pitch, just missed, and it's two and two. Just as Dallas Green is facing with the Yankees, you, if you're a player, you'd like to think you start with a clean slate with a new manager, no preconceived notions. You pretty much know in spring training who is going to play and who is going to be your regular players and who's also going to be platoon. Check swing and Cateray fields it to get out of the inning. Cateray got 
two lefties out, but the White Sox do get a run. They now lead 7-4 to four after 7. Just a right field for the White Sox. And Jeff Schaefer stays in to play second base. Eighth inning, Barry Jones the pitcher. Stan Javier the batter. And a 7-4 White Sox lead. Javier hitting left-handed for the first time today. It's been a stronger side in the first two weeks of the regular season. Last year hit about the same from both sides. When he first came up, Bobby, people made a lot about him being the son of Julian Javier. Now we're at the point where we have a father and a son playing at the same time in Major League Baseball. Ken Griffey Sr. with the Reds. Ken Griffey Jr. with Seattle. I have yet to see uh, Ken Griffey Jr. play, but by the reports, they say he is a cannot-miss superstar. 2-2 Two -two now to Javier. The last time I saw Ken Griffey Jr. play was underneath the stands at Yankee Stadium and the kids used to play baseball while the dads were out playing baseball on the field. They were underneath the stands uh, with their with their stick balls. They had their own game going. Full count now from Barry Jones to Stan Javier. Jones working as the setup man here. White Sox plan to do this, use him as the setup man for Thick Pet, but now he walks Javier to start the eighth. White Sox have some activity in their bullpen. Bobby Thickpin warming up now. There's Thickpin. Torboard very candid that he's not doesn't have total confidence yet in what he has seen from Bobby Thigpen. Last year, a terrific year for a club that was not competitive and won only 71 ball games. Dave Henderson, the batter now, two-run homer in the sixth inning off Jerry Royce. Diaz to Schaefer. Off, but Robodeau tags Henderson. Double play. A pitcher's best friend, especially in this situation. Schaefer throws the ball off the mark at first base with the good reaction by Robodeau at first. He tags the runner coming by. 14th double play already for the White Sox this year. And they have to feel as long as people hit the ball again, their defense is going to be all right. At least to start the play. You never know what's going to happen, especially around the second base. As Lyons is their starting second baseman normally, he was at third last year. This is the first year he has played at second base. Schaefer is a guy that can play also short and third. Steinbach takes it, ball two and strike one. The starting second baseman for the White Sox last year was most of the year was Fred Manrique, who began this year in the minors and was called up with the injuries to Fisk and Pasqua. Now three and one, and Barry Jones landed wrong on that pitch, and that'll bring activity out of the White Sox dugout. He hurt himself. I don't know if it was his arm or if it was a knee or an ankle. They're going to go right to the bullpen and not yeah. take any chances as he is really in a lot of pain right now. I didn't see any uh, sliding. He just hurt his arm. His arm was hurt on that pitch and it looked like the shoulder. That is not a pretty sight. 
Barry Jones day ending and let's hope it's not more than that on one pitch we'll be back in a moment Bobby Thigpen the third Chicago pitcher and his first pitch to Terry Steinbach was rifled off Eddie Williams at third base for a hit and you've got the right word a rifle and Williams tries to get in front of that rifle that scored a base hit Carney Lansford the batter now big pen with two saves got off to a rough start in non save situations the first week of the season but he had a, just an awful end to spring training and Jeff Torborg was very concerned Yes, he was, because Thigpen was uh, overthrowing. He wasn't pitching at that time, and Torborg told him, he said, look, I'm a little bit concerned about what's happening, and uh, even though you saved 34 games for me last year, or for the White Sox last year, you're going to have to start pitching instead of overthrowing on the mound. Thigpen saving 34 for a team that only won 71. Missing inside the Lansford, it's two and two. Big Pen last year had a 2.4 ERA in save situations, 5.1 in non save situations. And Lansford delivers a hit. And so the Athletics, for the first time, will get the tying run to the plate with two out here in the eighth inning and the person of Dave Parker. That's the guy that you do not want to see come to the plate in a situation like this with the right-hander Bobby Thickpin on the mound and the big basher from the left side for the Oakland A's and Dave Parker. And Thickpin's difficulties last year when he had them were with left-handed batters. Lefties hit 316. That's an astonishing batting average. Left-handed batters hit against Bobby Thigpen last year. He's been up in the strike zone a lot more than he normally did. Parker fouls it back. And a lot of that comes from trying to overthrow. Even though he is a power pitcher, you try to overthrow that fastball, and you get underneath with your elbow, and it causes you to miss up in the strike zone, plus you're taking something off of your fastball. Two on, two out in the eighth. Parker to center field. It's tailing away from Gallagher, but he runs it down to end the inning. Well hit ball by Parker, but Gallagher runs it down, and after seven and a half, it stays seven to four White Sox. On the seventh. Well, it was Oakland that set the pace last year in April in Texas. Doing it this year at 9-1. Milwaukee leading Cleveland in the fifth inning. Bottom of the eighth, 7-4 White Sox. Greg Cattery trying to keep it there and giving his team one more shot. Despite all the injuries, Bobby Oakland still coming in today 7-4. Tony LaRusso can in no way be upset with his team's start. The guy took all kinds of precautions in the offseason to make sure his team would be ready to defend. He talked to Bill Walsh. He talked to Vince Dooley. Read Pat Riley's book. He even had Reggie Jackson come in spring training and talk to his club about what it was like to try and repeat. Of course, Reggie was with the great Oakland ball clubs back in the 70s and of course with the New York Yankees. And Williams grounds that through the hole and has his third hit. Coming up on NBC Sports, the second half of your Game of the Week doubleheader, most of you will see the Mets and the Cardinals with Bob Costas and Tony Kubek in St. Louis. Some of you will see the Astros and the Dodgers in Los Angeles. We certainly send along our wishes. Best of luck to Charlie Sloes, who makes his network debut, working with Larry Durker. For those of you who will see the Astros and Dodgers in the second half of our doubleheader. Now, 
Ozzie Guillen batting. Right-hander Eric Plunk is throwing in the A's bullpen. season talking about the great start Oakland had they went into first place on April 20th and they stayed there every day the rest of the way they won 18 of 19 games in that great stretch they had late in April early in May and that really pulled them away from the pack Texas off to the that type of a start this year, winning nine of their first ten. That's trouble in the left center by Polonia. And a base hit. Eddie Williams to second. Guillen at first with his third hit. The big hit of the ball game, Bobby, in the second inning. Gallagher with a three-run shot in the left field really set the White Sox on their pace and in that outstanding catch that he made on that liner that was sinking or uh, going away from him off the bat of Parker in the last inning. Now the White Sox are threatening again here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Cataray looks like that's going to be all for him as Tony La Russa is out to the mound once again. That right-hander Eric Plunk was warming up so we will probably see the big right-hander. That's exactly who it is. Plunk trotting in to face Gallagher with two on nobody out here in the eighth inning. The White Sox leading seven to four and Dave Gallagher hoping to add to that lead. Third pitching change for the Oakland A's in the game this afternoon. Right-hander Eric Plunk will come in. Nobody out here in the bottom of the eighth inning and the White Sox have two men on as you can see that Plunk has two and two-thirds innings pitched this year. He struck out four. He's six foot five, 210 pounds. A hard throwing right hander. Spent his first full year in the majors last year, which he picked in 49 games for the A's. But the A's are trying to keep the White Sox from putting any more runs on the board as they are threatening here. And Dave Gallagher will be the first batter that Plunk faces here in the bottom of the eighth. Well, Bobby, you look at Eric Plunk and what was the difference between Oakland and the rest of really the rest of the American League last year and I think most people felt it was their pitching depth they could go 10 deep into their staff and bring quality arms up and Eric Plunk is one of them who'd be a, a top-notch closer for some clubs he'd probably start for others yet spent most of last year in no offense, but he was kind of a caddy for Eckersley most of last and they year. They just put Gene Nelson on the disabled list this afternoon. Weiss dancing behind Williams, trying to keep him close at second. Finally, Plunk steps off. Oakland looking fun at first and third here with Gallagher at the plate. Baines and Calderon, two big hitters coming up behind him. The guy dancing around at second base does two things. It breaks the concentration of the pitcher. He's worried about the runner at second. He also loosens that infielder up and Walt Weiss, who is trying to keep him close to the back. Now, as a batter, would you prefer to bunt against a hard thrower like Plunk? No. No. I like the soft guys in a bunting situation. A soft thrower. It's a strike one and one. Normally a hard thrower will try to keep the ball up in the strike zone on a guy that he know is trying to bunt on him. It's harder to get on top of that ball and bunt it on the ground. So they like to keep it up in the strike zone. Eric Plunk, he is the last remaining player in an Oakland A's uniform who came in the trade that sent Ricky Henderson to the New York Yankees. Actually 
should correct that. He's the last remaining pitcher. Stan Javier also came in the Henderson trade. Runners go. A pitch out. And they have Eddie Williams nailed. And Williams is tagged out as he almost made a mistake there. He had to stop short of the bag and allow himself to be tagged out. She finally did. And that enabled Guillen to run up and claim second base. That was a hit and run on a 1-1 pitch, and the Oakland Ball Club picked it up as the pitch out was on. Gallagher tried his best to try to get some wood on the ball as you take a look at Tobark. That's twice that the Oakland A's have picked up uh, yes. the situation on a on a hit and run or a stolen base. It's going to say Torborg's telling we're changing the signs to change tonight. The signs. <laughs> change him tonight. One and two the count. Breaking ball missing and it's two and two to Gallagher. In the ninth, Oakland will have Polonia, Weiss, and Hassey scheduled to bat. The seven, eight, nine spots, and they don't really have anything left on the bench to be able to use as far as pinch hitters. Well, if Gallagher does his job, or if he gets the bunt down, and they root, root, they had. If they had to move the runners up to second and third, they probably would have put Baines on and pitched to Calderon, but that's what you want. You got your fourth man hitting in a situation with the bases loaded. Ball gets by Hassey, who stumbled, and Guillen thought for a moment about coming all the way and stops at third. So the wild pitch now gives the White Sox a runner at third with one out and a 3-2 count. Gallagher a chance to try and drive one to the outfield for a run home. Eric Plunk hung on to that breaking ball just a little bit too long and threw it in the dirt outside. Hassey didn't have enough time to get out there to block it. Eddie Williams. Infield is in, and it's hit to Lansford, who's coming to the plate, and they have Guillen running down now. And Weiss just did get over there behind Lansford and takes the throw from Hasse. Tags out Guillen, who comes up shaking his right hand and right wrist after a head-first slide. And so the White Sox running themselves out of this inning. They have basically taking themselves out of a potential huge inning here at the bottom of the eighth. As you see Walt Weiss just getting to third base as, again, we were talking about that head first slide earlier and the jam fingers and the wrist that you can come up with and you can see again, boy, he, uh, he hurt his right, I don't know if it was his finger or his wrist, but you can certainly jam a lot of those uh, parts. Jeff Schaefer rolls the first pitch to Steinbach. And so Plunk, with the help of those base running uh, misplays, you may say, by the White Sox, and certainly the stolen sign. And that helps Plunk get out of the inning. And so the A's will have one last chance in the ninth with Polonia, Weiss, and Hassey to bat against Bobby Thinkpen and the White Sox leading 7-4. to four. Forget to join NBC Sports for the Tour de Trump. Americans Greg LeMond and Davis Finney will play host to the world's best cyclists in the inaugural Tour de Trump. It's America's Tour de France, starting in Albany, then on to New York City, through the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, then finishing up on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. The dawning of an American classic, the Tour de Trump. Coverage begins May 7th on NBC. And coming up immediately following our game, the second half of your Game of the Week doubleheader, most of you will see the Mets and the Cardinals from St. Louis. Some of you will see the Astros and the Dodgers.
in Los Angeles. Dwight Gooden pitching today for the Mets. Oral Hershiser pitching for the Dodgers. So the best in baseball coming up in the second game of our doubleheader on NBC. Those of you who are joining us originally, this is the Twins and Yankees today. If you're a, a late tuner in, that game was rained out today. Here we go to the ninth with the White Sox leading 7-4. to four. And Ozzie Guillen does come back out of the field to play shortstop for the White Sox after this slide in the bottom of the eighth. The, the right hand is the hand that he is shaking after this. Oh, there's what happened. Walt Weiss stepped on his right hand. It wasn't the bag at all that caused that injury. And you can imagine what that feels like and the kind of weather, the cool weather that we're having in Chicago this afternoon, and he can still feel it. But he's all right, and Torborg and the White Sox are happy about that. Luis Polonia, a pinch hit triple in the seventh inning, and a run batted in. That was against Barry Jones, now batting for the first time against Bobby Thigpen, and he takes strike one. You know, Ted, I, I, I guess the consolation to why stepping on the hand of Guillen is that most of these guys, they don't wear those uh, steel spikes anymore. They're rubber spikes, so that, that is a consolation. And, of course, when I say that, we're looking at some steel spikes on Ozzie Guillen's feet. So, Guillen may want to pay Walt Weiss back. <laughs> we didn't get a chance to see it if Weiss was wearing the steel spikes. Polonia hacking a foul. Stays 0 and 2. Polonia, Mets and Cardinals underway now. And the Astros and Dodgers in the bottom of the first. We're going to either of those two games for you as soon as our game here is complete. Polonia with a rather new fashion statement in baseball just in the last several years. One of the players who pulls his pant legs almost down to his ankles. There are several owners for whom he could not play wearing his pants that way. I wonder who you're referring to. One of them would be here at the White Sox. That's uh, Jeff Torborn. We'll talk about the hair. And Big Pen just blows a fastball by Polonian, strikes him out. What a difference in the style of the Oakland A's. The haircuts. Neatly cut and trimmed for the White Sox. And a lot of the Oakland A's look like they just got back from the rock concert. Well, it's become under the Haas family ownership. The Oakland Athletics have really become one of the premier organizations in baseball in the eyes of other players. Players constantly talking about it. I think it was evident in the fact that they were able to land Mike Moore, who was a heavily sought-after free agent pitcher in the offseason. Walt Weiss batting for the first time. Weiss is 9 for 28 this year. Third consecutive Oakland Rookie of the Year. Switch hitter who will have to have some adjustment, I'm sure, this year because the guy who was kind of his hitting guru is left. Jim LaFever, who was the A's third base coach the last several years, going to Seattle this year. He worked long hours with Weiss on his switch hitting. Guillen running it down in short left field, and Oakland is down to their final out. The Major League Baseball Game of the Week has been brought to you by Mitsubishi Motors, who invites you to come see the full line of cars and trucks. By Extra Gold Wrap, the beer with the big, bold, full tilt taste. By First Brands Corporation, makers of STP, son of a gun protected, son of a gun, what a difference. And by Burger King, where we do it like you do it. Now Ron Hassey, the batter, 0 for 3 in the game. Hassey now 1 for 13 on the season. And started this ball game because Bob Welch was pitching. And even though Jerry Royce, the left-hander who started for the White Sox, probably Hassey wouldn't be in there. Drilled into right center. Gallagher can't get it over his head. Now Hassey 
will leg it into second base with a double. And it will get the A's up to the top of the order one more time. Hassey with his first extra base hit of the year. And Tony Phillips now will bat. And the tying run moves into the on-deck circle in the person of Stan Javier. When you're behind three runs, your main purpose is to at least get two guys on the base pass so you can bring that tying run to the plate. You work the pitcher for a walk or you bunt or you just you have to do whatever you, you can to get yourself on the base pass. Three hits off thick pen. Phillips, left-handed batter, taking strike one. Oakland so benefiting the versatility of having three switch hitters in their order, all batting in this inning. Weiss, Phillips, and then Javier, who's on deck. One and one. Thick pen at Mississippi State where he went to college was an outfielder on the same team that had Will Clark, Rafael Palmero, Thick Pen hit fifth in that order. He was a spot pitcher, became a full-time pitcher with the White Sox in the minor leagues. That's a strike on the outside corner, one and two. Pitch like that shows you why he became a pitcher. Thick Pen throwing, now he is pitching. Spotting that fastball, that heat on the outside corner. Everybody in the stands up on their feet. One and two to Phillips. Foul back and out of play. division where Dennis Eckersley and Jeff Reardon have established themselves as the premier closers in the league. White Sox hope that Big Pen will be in that category when the rest of their club is ready to challenge. Certainly, you look at a team like Kansas City and you think, how good could they be if they had a Bobby Big Pen as their closer? Two and two now to Phillips. Barry Jones, who left the game in the eighth inning, is having his right elbow x-rayed. Left the game after throwing a pitch to Terry Steinbach in the eighth inning. Seven to four, White Sox. Big Penn trying to finish it. the seats and Phillips stays alive thick pin staying away 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 on Tony Phillips he got that one up in the strike zone a bit the fans here at Comiskey they want the strikeout there's no secret in all he wants is the out he doesn't care how he gets it Really no secret to him. It's just hard, harder, and hardest. Finally came inside and missed, so now it is three and two. Phillips was not ready for that at all. If that had been on the inside corner or caught the plate anywhere on the inside portion, he would have been out. He was looking away. That's where Thickpin was trying to get him out. He almost got hit by that pitch looking so far outside. Now the count has run full. A walk would bring the tying run to the point. And that 
to do it. Guillen shading his eyes. And the White Sox win it. Bobby Thigpen's third save. Gary Royce's second win. Bob Wells, the loser. Bobby Mercer, it's been a pleasure working with you. Likewise here, Chad. Thank you very much. And the White Sox with a big five-run second beat by Dave Gallagher's three-run homer win it. Stay tuned. The Mets and the Cardinals or the Astros and the Dodgers coming up next. I'm Ted Robinson along with Bobby Mercer saying